Sabbe satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dave Jacobson and I'm here with the 10th episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. Why is Nibbana such a secret? Why don't people understand it? Why can't they comprehend it? Well, the reason has to do with our language, our language and our philosophy. We're conditioned by so many understandings that are just plain wrong, that don't really reflect reality. Let's go back and pick up from where we left off last time. We were talking about the Buddha's response to some critics who accused him of annihilationism. And in response, after denying their accusations, the Buddha presented the fire simile. And it goes like this. Now, if a fire is burning in front of you, dependent on grass and twigs as fuel, you would know that it is burning dependently and not independently, that there is no fire in the abstract. And when the fire goes out with the exhaustion of that fuel, you would know that it has gone out because the conditions for its existence are no more. So in other words, existence is dependent on causes. There is no such thing as absolute existence, or for that matter, absolute non-existence. These are both extreme views, yet we have in our language embedded the Aristotelian logic, two-valued logic. Either it is or it isn't. Nothing in between. But the Buddha took the middle path. He said, there's no such thing as absolute existence, existence in the abstract, in the Platonic idealistic sense of an abstract idea or concept of fire, which then manifests in the world. And there's no such thing as absolute non-existence where there is no fire. No. There is the middle way of becoming. In other words, due to certain causes and conditions, phenomena come into being. They don't just pop out of nowhere, but they are the result of causes. And if we can understand these causes, if we can understand this process, then we can gain control over this process of becoming, which is going on all the time. So let me read on. When the fuel is exhausted, we say the fire goes out. But of course, it doesn't go anywhere. It just ceases. It ceases because the conditions necessary for its being have ceased. That's the principle of dependent origination, paticca samupada, that when this is, that is. When this arises, that arises as well. And when this is gone, that's gone. When this ceases, that also ceases. So, for example, a fire is a process of oxidation, clinging to a fuel like a piece of wood. This clinging is called upadana in Pali, and it has the meaning of both clinging or grasping and nourishment or fuel. So the fire is very simple. It needs the fuel to exist, to be. And as soon as the fuel is used up, the fire disappears. It doesn't come from anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. It simply arises in response to suitable causes and conditions, and when those causes and conditions change or cease, the fire goes away. It doesn't go anywhere. It just ceases. Okay, that's the background by which we can understand the Buddhist idea of Nibbana. Okay, similarly, our existence is also a kind of clinging. It's clinging to a type of fuel. 
and in our case the fuel is desire. Desire and ignorance. Because we don't know or we blind ourselves to the fact that existence dependent on desire always results in suffering. Look at the mess the world is in right now. And people have tried for thousands of years to solve the problems of human life, and they failed. Why? Because they're trying to fix the world. They're trying to change the conditions in the world and saying that if we do that, then that will stop suffering. And it hasn't worked, and it will never work, because the fundamental condition is desire. The fundamental cause of the becoming of human life is desire. If you take away that desire, then we can reach Nibbana. Then we can get out of this trap of desire and suffering. Huh? Suffering is there because of desire. Huh? Suffering clings to desire in the same way that the flame clings to the piece of wood. But when the wood is used up, the fire goes out, disappears. Similarly, when desire is used up or when desire is finished somehow or other, then the suffering also disappears. Does that mean that's the end of life? No, because the process of becoming is always there. The process of causation, the process of dependent arising, dependent origination, paticca samuppada. This is the core of the Buddha's teaching. And it's really strange to me that more Buddhist teachers don't teach it. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe it's hard for people to understand, and that's true. But still, if the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path are the, the road map of Buddha's teaching, then Paticca Samuppada is the engine that drives the car on that map. So we should understand this process of dependent origination. And we've already uh, made several videos about it. We're going to talk about it more in this series as well. We are also conditioned by the idea of eternalism. Eternalism is the concept behind, for example, the soul. The soul, the idea, this is also a Platonic ideal, that there is some essence of existence that exists eternally or exists beyond the world somehow or other, in some other world where things are somehow different. Uh, but there is absolutely no evidence of the existence of this other world. There's absolutely no reason to suppose that there is any place where things are different. The only experience we have, the only evidence we have, is of this world and the way things are right now. Because the way things are is the way they are forever. You might as well just accept it. It's not going to change. Anything that comes into being is also going to go out of being. Why? Because it's clinging. It's clinging to causes. It's clinging to fuel. Or as it's called sometimes in Buddhist philosophy, it's clinging to nutriment. And when that nutriment is used up, that being goes away. Now say, for example, um, oh, here's one that everybody can relate to, sex. People cling to the desire for sex. And this drives so much of their activities and thinking, strategic uh, plans for life, and so on. So people do so many unnecessary things just to facilitate their sex life. And then what happens? You get old, your body gets sick, and you can't engage in sex life anymore. So what happens to all those plans? What happens to all those desires? They're going to be frustrated. They're going to be thwarted by time, old age, disease, and death. So if we base our identity, if we base our activities, if we base our strategy for life on the desire for sex, what's going to happen? We're going to be frustrated. 
we're going to suffer. And there's no way out of this suffering except to drop that desire. But if we spend our whole life being conditioned by a certain desire, then to drop it is going to be mentally very painful. So the Buddha advises us right in the beginning, don't engage in inappropriate sex. And certainly don't base your life on it. Don't base your strategic approach to life and circumstance and relationships on this desire, because this desire is going to fail. It is an unreliable soldier in the battle of life. Uh, this guy is going to cave in and run when things get tough. So like a cowardly soldier that refuses to fight or even runs away from the battle. So all these desires, not only sex life, but every desire is ultimately going to fail. Except the desire for enlightenment. And why is that? Because the desire for enlightenment brings us to the state of being where there is no more becoming. And that is Nibbana. In Nibbana, we're fully satisfied. There are no desires. There is no time. So how can there be desire? Let's take a look at the anatomy of desire. Desire says... The way things are right now is not good. We want to change things so they're better. Huh? In other words, the condition I'm in right now is displeasing. The condition that I want would be pleasing. Huh? Let's say I'm hungry. I'm hungry so I want some food. Now, this condition of hunger we have perceived as displeasing. So we want to change the condition to being full of food. So we want some food. This is a desire. What it does is it creates a feeling of now and then. It creates a future. A future that doesn't exist right now. And so we begin to strive. We begin to effort. We begin to work toward that future. So with food, it's a pretty, pretty simple desire. You know, it's pretty easy to satisfy, especially in the conditions we have today. Very easy to satisfy the desire for food. In fact, it's maybe a little bit too easy, and so people are becoming obese and like that. But still, see what happens with desire. I'm not happy right now, the conditions I have right now aren't giving me the kind of being that I want. So I want to change the conditions to change my being in the future. You see, subconsciously we are relying on the process of being and becoming. Although we don't realize what we're doing. We're just thinking, I want food. But the desire, the mechanism of desire creates a thisness, the way things are now, and an otherwiseness, or the way I want things to be in the future. It creates a present and a future. It creates a split in our being between what is and what we would like it to be. And so this necessitates a process of becoming. We have to decide what food do I want, then where can I get it, how can I prepare it if I need to cook or whatever? And then to sit down and eat it. So this is a whole process of becoming. To change the being of being hungry into the being of being satisfied. You see how that works? Well, this is true of every desire. Every desire that we have puts us on a treadmill of becoming. And we have to work. We have to make efforts to move along this road from thisness, the way it is now, to thatness, or the otherwiseness of the way we want to be. So this is the origin of work. And now, of course, in our society today, everyone is so preoccupied with work. But what are we doing? Well, ostensibly, we're satisfying our desires 
for food and shelter and so many other things. But actually, what we're doing is making a capitalist rich. We're selling our labor at a discount price to an aggregator who uses it to create a product for the marketplace and make a profit. So it's actually a very bad deal right on the face of it. Because why should we sell our labor at a discount price? We could sell the same labor retail and get much more for it. So I'm not going to go into that right now, but still take a look at that. <laughs> uh, the point is we are accepting this bad deal because of our desires. Because we cannot see in a disintermediated world full of corporations, how to satisfy our desires simply and directly. For example, if I want food, I can plant a garden, or I can do some work and trade my work for food. What's wrong with that? Well, we have to find someone who's willing to trade that kind of work for that kind of food, but it's much simpler, much more direct, and it's easier because you get more value for your work that way. So I'm not going to go into the mechanics and economics of work and trade and like that. The point is to show how clinging to desire is the cause of suffering. Whether it's through work or because of sex and all the complications that come from that. No matter what desire we try to pursue, we always find all kinds of unanticipated complications isn't it? We find that our desire has all kinds of undesirable effects because it forces us to do things that we would never do or that we would never choose to do because we're under the compulsion to attain this desire. So desire is really the cause of suffering. And to get rid of desire means to drop this idea that what is now is not okay. It means to drop the notion that there's anything wrong with our state of being in the present. How do we do that? We have to experience so much pleasure in the moment, so much pleasure from the way things are right now, that we can drop the idea that we want to change it to make it better. It's very simple. Where do we get that pleasure? Well, the Eightfold Noble Path is full of methods for experiencing pleasure without desire. How is that, you might say? Well, first of all, we have to cultivate integrity. And we have a whole series on integrity. <laughs> that was one of the first things we produced. Because without integrity, meditation is a waste of time. If you can't keep your word, if you can't keep your agreements, if you're not trustable, if you're not truthful, if you're not a person whose promise is meaningful, then don't even bother with meditation because it won't work. For every bit of merit that you collect by your meditation, you'll be spending it on false promises and you'll be losing or gaining demerit, bad karma, on the basis of untruthfulness and so on. And also, let go of intoxication. Let go of gambling. Actually, gambling attracts all kinds of nasty activities in people. Oh, it's one of the worst things because, as we see, all kinds of illegal nonsense goes on around gambling. Uh, gambling is cheating by its very nature. Whoever is the best cheat then becomes the winner. It's not, it's again, it's one of those really bad deals. The house always wins. So drop gambling, drop intoxication. If you can, become celibate, drop sex life, huh? and all these other desires. The desire for wealth, for example. The desire for taking what is not given. In other words, cheating, stealing, and so on. Drop all these desires. This is the reason behind the Buddha's precepts. The rules, the ten rules that are given for beginners and many, many more rules for more advanced people. 
that these things cause suffering because they represent desires. Desires that lead us to negate the way we are right now and say that's no good and also lead to all kinds of complications that we didn't ask for, that we didn't anticipate, that we don't want. So why engage in suffering? Why cling to the causes of suffering? We can let go of these desires. Well, then you might say, then how am I going to enjoy my life if I don't do all these things? And the answer is jhana. Jhana means concentration, meditation. And there are eight jhanas according to our level of development in concentration. This comes near the end of the Eightfold Path. First, we have to make sure we have right view. Right view is the very first item of the Eightfold Noble Path. So we have to hear from people who understand, from people who are experienced, from people who know the taste of Nibbana and how to get there. Because just a tiny taste of Nibbana can set us up for the whole day. Even a momentary little drop of Dhamma, of Nibbana, is going to make our day. And so we've given so many meditation processes, so many methods in the suttas and in our course, 100 Days to Enlightenment. If you actually follow these methods, if you actually perform them properly with the right view as the basis, then you will certainly get the result and you can free yourself from this trap of desire. Sabbe satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta